Okay, welcome back to microeconomics for this very last part of our course. So finally, now we will go to the coordination of supply and demand through markets. We have learned a lot about demand and choices. We also did some intensive analysis of production and supply. We also got in touch with the very first concept of equilibrium via game theory tools. And now this is what it is for. It is actually for me, this is what I had in my, the first thing I had in mind whenever I think about, or I hear somebody saying about microeconomics, that's market equilibrium. That's like the first thing pop up in my head. Anyhow, we will look at market demands to revisit what we have learned, but also to deepen some things using the quantitative tools that we have practiced for the whole time up to now. now and then we will learn also how to distinguish very short run, short run, long run analysis of market equilibrium. Uh, so that's what we going to do. So even though, like I said, there's no compulsory assignment for this part, but it's actually something called save the best for the last. Nah. And this is going to be um, the finalization of the course. So let's make it great. I'm sure a lot of things you will find familiar. That is already good. Let's go. The first part is about market demand. So let us first go back to the demand and choice part in the beginning of the course where we have derived the Marshallian demand functions for the consumption of two goods. Nah. So let's say we have derived the unconditional or Marshallian demand function for good X. Nah. The quantity of X is a function of its price, the price of the other good, and income of the individual, right? So that we focus only on one individual back then. Now, when we talk about market demand, it is simply the sum over all individuals who consumers in that market now. So the market demand for that good now denoted as the capital X, large X for the whole market, now, the whole population of consumer will be the sum over N, over the total number of individuals in the population of their Marshallian demand functions. Um, now, even though this sounds simple, and I also mentioned something like just simply, no, there are a few things that we should pay attention. So the first thing, no, let's say, Px and Py enter this summation without any index or subscript i. No. So implicitly that means Px and Py the same for everyone. And this is called law of one price. No. Law of one Price. So I will come back to this shortly. 
later. However, income, when it enters this market demand, it has to the subscript I. No? What does that mean? That means even though at the end you sum up the demand of individuals, the difference between the income of individuals in this population, or we call that the distribution of income. Like, for example, the poor and the rich, no? the city and the rural area, that's the income distribution. Okay, so the, the distribution of incomes matters, not just the sum of total income of that population. No? So for that reason, we can't have just one eye for everyone. No? But we have, if we sum up N individuals, then we have to have N I N income of n individuals in there as variables, you know? That's one thing should keep in mind, but I will repeat from time to time. You know? Now, if you want to represent this aggregated demand on a graph from individual demands no, to market demand. The way we do it is called horizontal aggregation. No. So you sum, why horizontal? Because we sum up the quantity of goods. No. And the quantity of goods normally on the horizontal axis of the graph. So because we sum up the quantity demanded from each individual, at the end, we sum horizontally. No. Okay, just very general idea. And uh, now we look at it on the board. Okay, now let's do one example about how to sum up the market demand from individual demand. Yeah. So here we have the demand for oranges from the first individual. Now given by this Marshallian demand function, you can see it depends on the price of oranges. Yeah. Depends on also the income of that individual. And then depends on the price of other goods here, crab fruit. Now, and similar, we have another individual, it's called individual 2, with another demand function. Now, we could derive the market demand as large x, now for orange, equals simply x1 plus x2 which is now let's do it step by step 10 uh, plus 17 so 27 minus 2 px here minus another px the same px so minus 3 px now uh, plus 0 0.1 I want, there's no other I want, so we write it, right, and then plus another 0 0.05 I2, so we can't sum this I up, like set on the slide, no? plus 0 0.5 PY, here there's another 0 0.5 PY, so we have 1 PY. Now, so 
This is the market demand for orange. Okay? So there are two things. Two, not this about. No. So the price. You simply sum up the coefficient of the price across individuals. Why we could do that? Because of law of one price. Yeah. So price is given to each individual in the market as the same. Yeah. So when you look at here, maybe you got confused a little bit. Here we have three PX. How can you call it law of one price? That I had also in the beginning the impression, but actually because PX is the same, and that's why we could sum them up to this number, to sum the coefficients. So the numbers, this small number before each of the variables here, when we, for example, if you take econometric matrix, then it's very often uh, heard as coefficient. Okay, so similar for PX and PY because they are the same. Every individual in the market face the same price. So that's law of one price. Why? The reasons are a little bit complicated behind, but for now, just accept that. Okay, now. And the first thing, Sorry, that's the first thing. The second thing, we didn't sum up I1 and I2 because, remember, the distribution of incomes among individuals in the market matters for the aggregated demand. No? So you can't treat them as a general I. You could do that, but I show later, we need special treatment. For that. Okay, so let's write it here again. First thing, law of one price allow us to sum up price coefficient of the price of each goods, yeah? PX and PX, PY and PY. The second thing is distribution of income matters. So we can sum up I1 and I2. Okay, at this stage. Now, the next question to ask is how to graph them on a two dimension graph, like a demand curve. So, for a demand curve, what is demand curve? That is, you graph, you connect each point of quantity demanded corresponding to each level of price, right? So one ASUS must be quantity and the other must be the price. Which price? Price of X, no? So you only have two arguments for two ASUS on that graph. Because of that, no, we need some numbers for the other variables for example, PX, uh, sorry, not PX, but PY, I1, I2. No. So we assume um, I1 equals 40, I2 equals 20, and PY equals 4. No. Then our demand, market demand becomes 27 minus 3 PX plus 
0 0.1 times 40 plus 0 0.05 times 20 nah, plus 4. That means x equals, nah, now simplify everything, 24, sorry, 27. Here is 4, right? So 27 plus 4 plus 0 0.05 times 20 is 1, right? And plus another 4, and that we have 36. So 36 minus 3px. And it's actually a linear function in this example. Now, now the thing is, normally when we graph the demand curve, we put the x on the horizontal axis and the px on the vertical axis. For that, we need some to inverse this demand, this market demand. Yeah. So we could do that by first putting 3px to the other side and like switch the place of 3px and x. So we would have 3px equals 36 minus x, right? Therefore, px equals 12 because you divide it by 3, right? Minus x divided by 3. Nah. So this is what we can use to graph the demand curve, the market demand curve of orange. Go back later. Let's put the market demand on the graph. Nah. So like I said, usual never really straight like I said we usually graph P on one on the vertical axis and X the quantity on the horizontal axis now let's determine the two intercept to the two axis now okay so this is what we have derived now so now, if you set px to 0, then x is 36. Let's say that is h square for 12, okay? Yeah. So 36 here. And then if you set x to 0, then px is 12. Yeah. So this should be here. 12. Here. Yeah. And then we could already grab this line. This is not really straight. But let's imagine, okay? As usual with me graphing, you always have to imagine a bit. Yeah. So is this is the demand curve, the market demand curve for uh, x. So it shows like every point on this line shows how x changes when px changes. Set the risk variables. What does that mean? That means holding all other factor constant. Remember, before originally we have also PY, I1, I2 in there. So, right? And now we, because we keep them constant, that's why we could arrive in this graph. Okay? Now you might ask yourself, what if these factors 
behind in the background does not show on the axis of the graph changes. Like for example, PY change, what happens? We could see that actually let set PY now equal uh, 10, right? So before that, we have 36x equal 36 minus 3px, yeah? but we also have py plus py inside. Okay, let, let's write it now. Yeah? So x equal 27 minus 3px plus 0 0.1 1i1 plus 0 0.05 i2 and plus py. Yeah, so now py equal 10, everything else like before, so that is 27 minus 3px plus 0 0.1 times 40 plus 0 0.05 times 20 plus 10 which is x equals 42 minus 3px. Uh, you actually could see now it's 10 before it's 4, so 6 more, and you remember this is a plus py, so we could just simply plus 6 more into this, so it's arrived in this exactly the same thing. Okay? So now, if you solve for px, that would be 42 divided by 3 is 14 yeah, minus x divided by 3, like before. Yeah. So for that, the intercept will shift up. Yeah. Let's say it's 14 here. Okay. And because the slope stay the same, minus one third, nothing changed. So this should be parallel, right? Again, it's, it's a bit curvy, but let's accept that. Okay. And this is when PY increase. Yeah. So you see, when the price of other goods change, the demand curve shift parallelly, right? Shifted parallel. Sorry, one else missing late. Now that is one case. Let's think a bit deeper in there. So when it shifted up there, what does that mean? That means for every price of a range, they will now the market will demand more, right? When it shifts outward or to the right hand side. Yeah. So this one is smaller quantity and this one is larger quantity. Yeah. What, why, when PY increases? What that does mean when PY increases, the demand shift outward and market demands more? So that, in that case, we actually have x and y are substitute. Yeah. Just up track a bit, not really directly relevant here, but good for you to observe that. Yeah. Because P, PY increases means y get more expensive. And when why get more expensive? They, the market demands more X. Like the population just starts to consume more X, right? So that's 
the sign or the signal of substitute should be with x. Okay. Now change to the second case. Yeah. Imagine we transfer uh, ten k of euro from individual one to individual two. How? Imagine um, the uh, government will tax individual one ten euro, ten thousand euro, and then give it to the second individual. Yeah? So that's one way of thinking about it. So now we would have I1 equals I2 equals 30, right? Because before the first one has 40, now take 10 from him or her, then that person would have 30. And before the second person would have 20, now 30, right? What happens then? Again, write down the demand for x now equals 27 minus 3px uh, plus 0 0.1 times 30, right? And then plus another 0 0.05 times 30 and plus py, just take it in the beginning, 4. No? So that would be, now we have to calculate again, 27 plus 3 plus 1.5, right? 30 times 0 0.05 plus 4, and that would be 35 0.5. Okay. Then the new demand is now 35.5 minus 3 px, meaning px equals 35.5 divided by 3 minus x divided by right now because the intercept changes now nah, got smaller so the and the slope remain the same minus one third so that means the demand curve now shift inward right we could a little bit here I mean, it's actually closer with the scale of this graph, but uh, that would be hard to say, to see, sorry. So let's say it's right now. Uh, so here is 35.5. Uh, and this intercept, and this is 35.5 divided by 3. Uh, so you can see, even though the total income of the market, like the, the demanders in the market, here two persons, remains the same, right? No one taking anything out permanently, you just put some taking from this person, given to the other person. No. So the total income remains the same, but the demand curve shifts also parallelly, but shifts inward, why is that the case? That is because the marginal effect of income of the first person is larger than the marginal effect of income of the second person in the market demand. And what is marginal effect? Again, this is something yeah, not trying to sell uh, my econometric course, but maybe a horror course. I don't know. 
don't know yet. But if you by chance take an econometrics, or you might know already from your earlier econometric classes, the marginal effect effect of um, I1 on X defines nothing by the slope of this function that is the partial derivative of x with respect to i1 and ceteris paribus again uh, normally say abbreviate STP no? So if you take econometrics and you forget this in your interpretation with OOS, you have deducted point. Okay? So this is the marginal effect. It's nothing else, just what you have learned before, how x changes when i changes. So here in this case, we clearly have nah, um, not working. So marginal effect of x with respect to i1, which is the derivative of x with respect to i1. Here, right? So 0 0.1, the coefficient, so to say, larger than the marginal effect of i2 on x. Now, which is 0 0.05. That says when the income of the second group increases, the demand, the total demand of the market for that good would not increase so much as if the income of the first person changed by the same amount. Now, yeah. so to sum up, you have seen already that when the price of Px changed, yeah. when Px changed, okay, now decrease, it will cause a movement along the demand curve. However, if everything apart from Px, like Py, I1, I2 changes, that will cause a shift in the demand curve parallelly. No? Let me write it here. Redistribution of income. That is why the distribution of incomes matter exactly because of this marginal effect. Now, last thing regarding this aggregation, we could also ask ourselves, okay, is there any way actually that we could write the demand function as a function of total income? No, not just I1 and I2 and every single I all the time. How to do that? Well, actually it is possible, but the scope of applying is limited. So here is what we could do. We first need to weight the coefficient of income by total. Not by total, but by the income itself. No? So that, what does that mean? That means we could rewrite x equals 27 minus 3px. I'm afraid that you guys cannot see from here anymore. 
Okay. Plus uh, 0 0.1 I1. Now I have a bracket. Why I have a bracket, you will see. 0 0.5 I2. Yeah. Everything divided by I1 plus I2. Let's write it. Here I equals I1 plus I2. Yeah. And times I1 plus I2. Yeah. So it's actually just an algebraic transformation which doesn't change the nature of the equation because we divide it by the sum but we also time the sum. Yeah. But it will be helpful later, okay? Plus P1, right? Now, for a base year, for example, a year you started measuring market demand and income, we have I1 equal 40 as before and I2 equals 20. Yeah. Then our demand function will become, sorry, X equals 27 minus 3px rewrite plus uh, plug in uh, inside there is 0 0.1 times let's give a square bracket 0 0.1 times 40 plus 0 0.05 times 20 uh, divided by 40 plus 20. Uh, okay, that is, okay, let's forget this part. Now we're just calculating the weight. Uh, so let's forget this part. Ignore it. Uh, then that would be four, right, plus uh, one over 60 is 112. Now, and now we could use this, sorry, not one half, but 112. We could use this weight to attach to the total income. Now, so that would make our market demand equals 27 minus 3px plus the whole thing here we calculated 112 right i1 plus i2 substituted by i total income plus py so that is how we could rewrite the market demand function as a function of total income However, please, please, please keep that in mind. No. Only valid when income distribution distribution does not change. No. Because, like we showed before, if even if I doesn't change at all, but that income is transfer among I1 and I2, I make a mistake here again, I1 and I2, the demand function, the demand curve will shift. It will not be this one, the same one anymore. Okay? So, the scope of applications limited for this total I. Huh? And that's also why later when you see the definition of income elasticity of market demand that also must come with the assumption that income distribution doesn't change. Okay. Since most of the case, consumers do not only consume one or two goods, but a basket of many different goods. Uh, and we also have not just 
to individuals in the market, like the previously shown example, but maybe a million, two million, or more than a billion in the case of many countries, right? So for that, we need some more general notation. No? So now if we have the subscript I, turn back for goods, no? and we have N goods in total. And then we have another subscript J for individuals with M individuals, sorry, in the individuals in the population. No? So then we can denote the individ individual demand function of each of these individuals for each of these good as x i j. So the demand for good i of person or individual j nah, will be of course a function of its own price. And remember the price of all other goods, like every other goods, the price of them counted in this demand because of the trade up, because of budget constraint. I hope you still remember something there. And his or her income. Nah. So that's the generalization of the individual demand. Now to come to the market demand. Nah. So remember, when we talk about market demand, we want to see the overall demand of the whole population, like sum over all these individuals. Nah. However, remember, all the prices of all the goods are still inside there, even though we're looking at good I. Nah. And then again, we can't just look at one, uh, let's say I as a total uh, income running from J equal one to M of IJ. That's the total income of uh, the, for example, let's say the GDP of a country. Now we have to look at the distribution of income among these individuals. So again, we sum up across M individuals. Yeah, the demand for good I. Up to this point, it's still very intuitive. Yeah. One thing to repeat again at this point is the change in any of these arguments, no? except changes in PI for good for that good of interest no? will shift the demand curve parallelly, right? Remember that. So often when we focus only on one market and everyone implicitly agree that we only talk about that market, we will abbreviate or simplify the notation a bit. So in that case was the case in the beginning, remember we only have one X nah, without any subscript I and implicitly we understand that we're talking about a market for I, okay? And in that case, we will use the following notations. For example, we use QD as the market demand for that good, the demand of the whole market, the whole population. Huh? And then we also have QS, as the market supply 
a total supply to that market of all producers who's producing that good. Yeah. And we also have capital P for the market price at the equilibrium. Yeah. 